Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my first ever episode in English. Well, as they say, special circumstances require special means. Over the past two weeks, like many young Tunisians, I've been following how international media is treating what's happening in Tunisia. My fellow commentators who have been projecting their ideas, writing their articles without talking to Tunisians. This episode is dedicated to you. Before we start, go get your drink and sit tight as we explain the situation. July 25th, Republic Day. Tunisians in many parts of the country took to the streets to protest against the government, the parliament, and politicians. Those who they saw responsible for the broken economy and the pandemic crisis that killed almost 20,000 people. Protesters targeted the different regional headquarters of another political party. A direct message that they are fed up with them ruling the country for 10 years. The same night, President Qais Saeed invoked Article 80 of the Constitution. This article gives him extra powers to deal with imminent danger to statehood, national security, and the country's independence. Under this article, the president can take any measures necessary by the exceptional circumstances to ensure the safety of the country. At that moment, and after seeing the mass protests continuing in many regions of the country, the president decided to sack the head of government, freeze the parliament's work, and lift immunity from its members. At the same time that the president was giving his speech, Another party was holding a press conference about what happened during that day, accusing protesters of being paid to burn their headquarters. It's incredibly important to tell you that people have been protesting against successive failing governments and politicians for years. The last wave of protests that erupted in December was met with repression and police brutality. Hisham Mishishi, the head of government and acting minister of interior, who was supported by the governing coalition of Nahda, Qalb Tunis and Aitilaf al-Karama, gave the green light to security forces to arrest more than 2,000 people. 600 of them were minors. People were grabbed during protests, snatched from their homes at night, and some of them were tortured. After invoking Article 80, people went to the streets to celebrate the president's decision. For the first time in months, and especially after COVID lockdowns and curfews, the Tunisian streets were alive. At the same time on social media, supporters of another party were denouncing these measures and saying it's a coup. As Western analysts quickly ran to the conclusion that our democracy is in danger and it's a coup, Tunisian constitutional experts, political parties, activists were split between supporters and opponents of the president's decisions. Not a single shot was fired, not a single person was detained without having a case in court and not even one was deprived from his freedom of speech. However, international observers and journalists were still warning of the situation which may threaten democracy according to them. But what is democracy? Is it only elections, laws and institutions? Unfortunately, some experts believe in procedures more than good practices. Election and institutions should be a way of governing and ensuring the public interest. The fears are almost comprehensible because many international experts, NGOs and journalists haven't been paying attention to what was really happened. Nida Tunis, the winner in the legislative and the presidential elections, had introduced itself as an alternative to the Nahda, which won in the 2011 elections and destroyed the country. But then, Nahda and Nida became allies and governed together. In 2019, Nahda won the elections and had promised not to rule the corrupt, referring to Qalb Tunis, the party led by Nabil Qarwi, a suspicious businessman and media mogul. But only a few days later, Nahda and Qalb Tunis made a deal to share leadership of the parliament. Rashid Ghanoushi was elected president and Samira Shawishi from Qalb Tunis vice president. This corrupt political system motivated corrupt people to run for elections and protect themselves with parliamentary immunity. There are 30 deputies with pending legal cases against them, ranging from corruption, money laundering, and fraud. The Tunisian parliament during the past 10 years has become an umbrella for corrupt politicians. In addition to that, the another party after the 2011 revolution worked on controlling the judicial branch and put their people in critical
political position. At the top of them was Bashir al-Akrami. Bashir al-Akrami, who has now been put under house arrest, is accused of burying evidence and files in many terrorism cases. Most importantly, the political assassination of Shukri Bilaid and Muhammad Lebrami. Eventually, the political scene in Tunisia became more like a business. Deals are made and personal interests are put before the public interest. This led to the near collapse of the Tunisian economy, rising employment and poverty rates. The accumulation of anger and frustration peaked on July 25th, which led the president, who is not a traditional politician, to invoke Article 80. For the moment, many want to believe in Kais Saeed legal expertise, pro-revolutionary rhetoric and anti-corruption promises. Tunisians are aware of the critical moment and circumstances that they are going through. However, they are hopeful that this could be a new beginning for a more solid democracy which can bring prosperity to the country. This was today's episode explaining what happened on July 25th and its whole context. I hope you liked the episode and if you did, don't forget to subscribe Put a like, a comment, and especially share it with your friends. And hopefully, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.